Al-Bara ibn Azib radiallahu anhu reported from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the deceased, meaning a person who has just died, when they're buried, then they hear the beat of the sandals of people as they return from the grave. And at that moment, the angels arrive and ask him certain questions. The first question is, O oh, so and so, who is your Lord? And then, what is your religion? And then, who is your prophet? So when they ask him, who is your Lord? He replies, my Lord is Allah. When they ask him, what is your religion? He replies, my religion is Islam. When they ask him, what is your opinion about the man who was sent among you? He replies, he is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the angels ask him, who told you all of this? So he replies, I read the book of Allah and I believed in it and I considered it to be true. So we see the benefit of studying the book of Allah, that it gives us not only certain knowledge, it gives us not only belief, but it also gives us confidence. Through this book, a person will be helped in the grave during this questioning. We also learn that in the grave, a person will actually be protected from the punishment because of their recitation of the Qur'an. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu reported that when a man is placed in his grave and he is approached by punishment from the side of his head, then his recitation of the Qur'an repels it. And when he is approached from his sides, then his charity repels it. And when he is approached from the side of his feet, then his walking to the masjid repels it. So we see that the recitation of the Qur'an is a means of protection in the grave from punishment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to increase in our recitation, to increase in our understanding and in our knowledge so that the Qur'an is a means of guidance for us in this life and a source of protection and safety for us in the next life also. Ameen. Juz number 15. Surah Al-Isra. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير Exalted is he who took his servant by night from المسجد الحرام to المسجد الأقصى whose surroundings we have blessed to show him of our signs. Indeed, he is the hearing, the seeing. The surah, Surah Al-Isra, it begins with tasbih, that all glory is for Allah, that Allah is perfect. Meaning, yes, there is a truly astonishing news that is just about to be given here. But the fact is that what people find shocking is in fact not difficult for Allah at all. Because he is above any weakness whatsoever. And what is being mentioned here is truly glorious. So yes, subhanallah. And what is that astonishing news? It is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his servant, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, abduhu wa rasooluh, he took him by night from al-masjid al-haram to al-masjid al-aqsa and back. And what is al-masjid al-aqsa? What kind of a place is it? It is الَّذِي بَارَكْنَا حَوْلَهُ Whose surroundings we have blessed. So what do you think about the masjid itself? It is indeed blessed. Not only physically, where the land is fertile, but it has also been the birthplace and home of many prophets. So for a long time, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, its surrounding area, has been the place that has supported people's physical and spiritual sustenance. And what was the purpose of this journey? لِنُرِيَهُ min ayatina To show him of our signs. So over here, indication is to the journey of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj, the night journey and the ascension. That was not only a gift for the Prophet ﷺ, but also a miracle. 
Remember that the Isra is the journey from Mecca to Jerusalem. And Mi'raj is the journey from Jerusalem to the heavens above. It is the ascension. And remember that this journey was not a dream. It was a reality. So it occurred in body and soul. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was taken from Mecca to Jerusalem on the Buraq, which, contrary to what many like to believe, was not actually a winged horse. It was a creature that is described as white and long, larger than a donkey but smaller than a mule, who would place its hoof a distance equal to the range of vision. Because, وَيَخْلُقُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah has created creatures that you don't even know of. So here, in Jerusalem, the Prophet ﷺ, إِلَى الْمَسْجِدُ الْأَقْصَى He led the rest of the Prophets in prayer, which symbolized his leadership of all mankind. As he ﷺ said, أَنَا سَيِّدُ وُلْدِ آدَمْ وَلَا فَخَرْ That I am the leader of the children of Adam, and there is no pride in that. The Prophet ﷺ was taken to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Why? In order to perform salah over there. Therefore, it is a sunnah, remember, to travel to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in order to pray there. And we, as the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ, should strive to visit this blessed place and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over there. Because it is one of the most sacred places on earth. And the reward for prayer over there is multiplied. After this, we learned that Jibreel took the Prophet ﷺ by hand and ascended into the heavens above. Now remember, these are matters of the unseen to which we cannot apply the laws of physics as we know. So time and speed and distance, all of these matters are irrelevant over here. So the Prophet ﷺ was taken up to the seventh heaven to a level where no human has been. Even Jibreel did not get to go beyond a certain point. And Allah Azza wa Jal spoke with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And at that time, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given three gifts. One of them was the five daily prayers. The second was the concluding verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. And thirdly, forgiveness for those in his ummah who do not associate partners with Allah. Now in this journey, the Prophet ﷺ was shown ayat, the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we learned that he was shown paradise and hell. He was shown hawb kawthar. And he was also shown the result of certain actions, both punishments and rewards. So we learned that he was shown the fate of those who backbite, those who trample people's honor. And such people were scratching their chests and faces with their copper nails. We learned that he was shown the fate of those who preach good things but don't practice themselves. Their lips were being cut by scissors of fire. And he was shown the nations of different prophets. We learned that he met many prophets and angels who gave messages and advice for the ummah. So we learned that the angels, they said to the Prophet ﷺ, that advise your ummah to do hijama, cupping, because it is good for health and a source of seeking treatment. Ibrahim salam, he said to the Prophet ﷺ, that say my salams to your ummah, and tell them that Jannah has good fertile soil, and sweet water, and it is plain and leveled land, and its plantations are subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, and Allahu Akbar. So subhanallah, amazing, this is truly amazing. And glory be to Allah, for this journey was a gift and a miracle, a source of much benefit. وَآتَيْنَا مُوسَى الْكِتَابِ And we gave Musa alayhi salam the scripture and made it a guidance for the children of Israel that you not take other than me as disposer of affairs. أَلَّا تَتَّخِذُوا مِن دُونِي وَكِيلًا This was the message, the essence of the scripture that was given to Musa alayhi salam. That the Bani Israel should know that they should not take anyone other than Allah as wakil. Now remember that wakil is someone that you entrust your affairs to so that they fulfill your needs. 
But only Allah is the one who is able to fulfill your needs. This is why Allah تَتَّخِذُوا مِن دُونِي وَكِيلَ Depend only on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. O descendants of those we carried in the ship with Nuh alayhi salam. Meaning, you are children of believers. Indeed, he was abdan shakura. He was a very grateful servant. We learned earlier that Ibrahim alayhi salam was described as shakir, someone who is grateful for the favors that Allah gave him. And here, Nuh alayhi salam is described as shakur. And remember that Shakur is someone who is very, very grateful. And if we look at the life of Nuh alayhi salam, his life was a long life of extreme hardship and continuous patience. He was patient. He remained hopeful and he endured great hardship. He worked very, very hard. So remember, this is all part of Shukr. Because gratitude is not just an emotion. It is meant to be expressed. It is meant to be exercised. And Nuh alayhi salam was shakur, meaning he was grateful in every situation. So just as he was grateful, you too should be grateful, for you are his descendants. We learned that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam also exhibited this level of gratitude. That when he would pray in the night to a point that his feet would swell up. And he was asked that why do you pray so much when your sins have been forgiven? He said, أَفَلَا أَكُونُ عَبْدًا shakura. Shall I not be a grateful servant, Abdan Shakur? So not Shakir, but Shakur. So remember, a Shakur person works very hard, exerts effort in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he sees his inability to be sufficiently thankful. So he does his utmost in thanking his Lord and in performing worship. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves shukr. We learn in a hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with his servant who says, Alhamdulillah, while taking a bite of food and while drinking a sip of water. Meaning with every sip and with every bite, when you say Alhamdulillah, this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. So when you say Alhamdulillah with every bite, you are expressing a lot of shukr. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that. And we conveyed to the children of Israel in the scripture, that you will surely cause corruption on the earth twice, and you will surely reach a degree of great haughtiness. So when the time of promise came for the first of them, we sent against you servants of ours, those of great military might, meaning your enemy was way stronger than you. When you rebelled and killed the prophets, then a people more rebellious than you were imposed on you. And they probed even into the homes, meaning they spread everywhere in your lands and fully assaulted you. And it was a promise fulfilled. Then we gave back to you a return victory over them. And we reinforced you with wealth and sons and made you more numerous in manpower. So when you fixed yourselves, then we fixed your condition as well. What is the lesson? The lesson is, in ahsantum, ahsantum li anfusikum, wa in asatum falaha. That if you do good, then you do good for yourselves. And if you do evil, you do it to yourselves. And this rule is for all. Then when the final promise came, we sent your enemies to sadden your faces and to enter the temple in Jerusalem as they entered it the first time and to destroy what they had taken over with total destruction. So we see here that the Bani Israel were warned very clearly, even before they entered Jerusalem, that if they committed corruption in the land, they would be evicted from it. And this is mentioned in the Bible also. In the book of Deuteronomy, it is said that Musa alayhi salam said to them that after you have had children and grandchildren and have lived in the land a long time, if you then become corrupt and make any kind of idol doing evil in the eyes of the Lord your God and arousing his anger, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you this day that you will quickly perish from the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. You will not live long upon it, but will be utterly destroyed. 
And so it happened. We learned that the Bani Israel were evicted from their homes at multiple occasions. The first time was in 516 BC when Nebuchadnezzar attacked and destroyed the first temple and sent them into exile. And the second time was in 70 AD when Titus destroyed the second temple and literally scattered the Bani Israel, dispersing them from their homeland. And this is something that didn't stop at that time. This is something that kept repeating. So we learn that you know, when a person, when a nation, when a community is good, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also blesses them. But when they become oppressive, then they're also treated with oppression. So this is a basic rule that in ahsantum ahsantum li anfusikum wa in asatum falaha. So the lesson is that we should live our lives with the fear of God. And we should realize that there are consequences to what we do, even in this world. Asa rabbukum an yarhamakum. It is expected that your Lord will have mercy upon you and allow you to return. Meaning every time that you do good, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change your situation. But if you return, meaning to sin, to oppression, then we will also return, meaning with punishment. And we have made hell for the disbelievers a prison bed. So there's a huge lesson in this, that whether it is an individual, a family, a community, a nation, no one should feel secure from the punishment of Allah. Then it is said, إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَامِ Indeed, this Qur'an guides to that which is most suitable and gives good tidings to the believers who do righteous deeds that they will have a great reward. We see that the Qur'an guides to that which is أَقْوَامِ that which is most correct, most suitable, meaning the best way of life. We see that in life, there are many times that we find ourselves, you know, making decisions. We don't know whether to go this way or that way. And there are so many difficulties and trials that we experience. So the Quran guides a person to the best options. So a person cannot be on the straight path. A person cannot be doing what is right until and unless they take guidance from the book of Allah. Because the Qur'an guides to that which is aqwam. So Ka'ab radiallahu anhu, he said, hold fast to the Qur'an. Because it is sharpness of the intellect, meaning it keeps the intellect sharp. And it is the light of wisdom. And it is a source of knowledge. It is the most recent book revealed by the most merciful. And Allah revealed in the Torah that, O Muhammad, I will reveal upon you a new Torah that will open blind eyes, deaf ears, and heedless hearts. This is why, hold on to the Qur'an. And the fact is that the person who strives even a little bit to understand the Qur'an, then definitely their life will be transformed. And the Qur'an gives good news to those people who believe and who do good deeds. Good news that they will have a great reward. So we see that the Qur'an gives hope to us. It saves us from despair. And that those who do not believe in the hereafter, we have prepared for them a painful punishment. Meaning the Qur'an also gives warning. وَيَدْعُ الْإِنسَانُ بِالشَّرِّ دُعَاءَهُ بِالْخَيْرِ وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ عَجُولًا And man supplicates for evil as he supplicates for good. And man is ever hasty. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said that this is when a person prays against himself or his children out of anger and frustration. While he does not actually want that prayer to be answered, meaning he doesn't actually mean it, but because of his impatience, and remember that impatience, hastiness, this is from shaitan, because of that, out of anger and frustration, a person begins to pray against himself. That, for example, a person is very sick, so they start praying for death. That a person is, for example, failing at something, then they ask for or they start praying for failure in every aspect of their lives. That a child has disappointed them and they start making dua against that child. That, oh Allah, I don't want these children anymore. Yani, this is impatience and this is from shaitan. So 
those people who pray in anger against themselves or against their wealth or against their children, such people are being reprimanded. That they should be praying for ease in a time like this. Because remember, the person who is muttar, the person who is afflicted with difficulty, yani that is the time to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah responds to the dua of the muttar, the person who is afflicted with difficulty. So this is not the time to be praying against yourself. We learn in a hadith, do not invoke curse on yourselves and do not invoke curse on your children and do not invoke curse on your servants and do not invoke curse on your property lest you happen to do it at a time when Allah is asked for something and grants your request. Meaning what if at that moment your dua is accepted? And remember that if you pray against someone and they're not worthy of it, then guess what? the dua will be turned against you. It will be turned against the person who has made that dua. So be very, very careful. And always pray for good when it comes to your children. Because remember that there are three duas which are certainly accepted. It is the dua of the oppressed, the dua of the traveler, and the dua of the father for his children. So a father especially should only make dua for what is good no matter how angry and upset he is. And be careful about what you ask. Because we learn that do not pray for anything except for good for yourselves. Because the angels say ameen over what you say. So you don't want that while you're making dua against yourself, the angel says ameen to that. And we have made the night and day two signs. And we erased the sign of the night and made the sign of the day visible. The night is dark, the day is bright that you may seek bounty from your Lord and may know the number of years and the account of time and everything we have set out in detail. So we see that different times are for different purposes. There is contrast in life. Things change, situations change, and there is a purpose behind that. So don't be impatient, but rather be patient and be grateful. وَكُلَّ insanin, And for every person, we have imposed his fate upon his neck. And we will produce for him on the day of resurrection a record which he will encounter spread open. Meaning the deeds that a person commits, then remember their outcome is tied to the person. Meaning their outcome is inescapable. And on the day of judgment, a person's record of deeds will be spread open before them, meaning it will be displayed right in front of them. So nothing will remain hidden. And it will be said, اقرأ كتابك Read your record. كفى بنفسك اليوم عليك حسيبا Sufficient is yourself against you this day as accountant. Meaning you can see for yourself what you deserve. And remember, a person's own limbs will testify against him. Your own nafs, meaning your own body, is enough to come as a witness against you. And you can see, based on your record, you can see for yourself what you deserve. So it is so important that we do this muhasaba, you know, this analysis, this introspection in this life, that we should really be honest with ourselves. We should honestly hold ourselves accountable. We should be self-aware. We should not be oblivious to our own actions, our own behaviors, our own words, that we don't pay attention to them. Whoever is guided, meaning whoever follows guidance. And this is only possible when a person reflects on their condition and realizes what they need to improve. And then when they find out, they learn, then they act upon that guidance. So whoever is guided is only guided for the benefit of his soul. In ahsantum, ahsantum li anfusikum. And whoever errs, only errs against it. Meaning no one else will suffer in his place. And no bearer of burdens will bear the burden of another. Meaning a person cannot put the blame on anybody else. And never would we punish until we sent a messenger. And when we intend to destroy a city, we command its affluent, but they defiantly disobey therein. So the word comes into effect upon it, and we destroy it with complete destruction. 
And how many have we destroyed from the generations after Nuh? And sufficient is your Lord concerning the sins of his servants as acquainted and seeing. And we see that with the Bani Israel also and the other nations of the past, we see that every time a nation defiantly disobeyed, their time eventually came to an end. So a person should not take their time and their freedom for granted. That I can do whatever we want. I can say whatever I want. No, there is a consequence to what we do. There is a consequence to what we say, to what we write. And we must take our actions very seriously. Whoever should desire the immediate, meaning this life, that they want the reward in this life, in this world, then we hasten for him from it, what we will to whom we intend. Then we have made for him hell, which he will enter to burn, censured and banished. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَأُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا But whoever desires the hereafter, their goal is not this world, but their goal is Jannah. That, Ya Allah, I want the home of the hereafter. I want your approval. I want you to be pleased with me. So whoever desires the hereafter, that is the goal, and exerts the effort due to it. Meaning it's not just a wish, but they also exert the right effort while he is a believer. Because remember, a good intention and good effort alone are not enough to save a person. Iman is also necessary. Then it is those whose effort is ever appreciated by Allah. So two types of people are mentioned over here. There are those who seek this world. There are those people who seek immediate gratification for the effort that they're exerting. Which is why when they don't immediately see any good result of their good actions, they become very upset, they become disappointed, and they quit. And then there are others who seek the hereafter. So even if they don't see any immediate benefit or any immediate result of what they're doing, then they still keep striving because وَعْبُدُ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ You're supposed to worship your Lord until the very end of your life, until death. So the one who intends for the hereafter, but that wish alone is not enough. They also exert the right effort because wishing for the reward of the hereafter without putting in the necessary effort, remember, it is merely that. It is just a wish. It is basically being delusional. Because when you want something, it is not enough to wish for it. When you want something, you have to strive for it. You have to work for it. So there must be intention and effort. And along with that, وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ With iman, with faith, فَأُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا Then Allah will appreciate their effort. Allah will appreciate their striving. كُلًّا نُمِدُّ هَؤُلَاءِ وَهَؤُلَاءِ مِنْ عَطَاءِ رَبِّكَ To each category we extend to these and to those. Meaning to the dunya seekers, we give them the little bit of dunya. And to the akhirah seekers, they will get whatever that they desire from the gift of your Lord. And never has the gift of your Lord been restricted. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a lot to offer. So don't settle with this world only. Look how we have favored in provision, some of them over others. But the hereafter is greater in degrees of difference and greater in distinction. Meaning, there's a huge difference between people. And we see this even in this life. That people who work harder, who study harder, longer, they reach levels that people who don't study or work hard can reach. So, there's a difference that we see in the world. And there's a much bigger difference that will be in the hereafter. Because there's a person who wants the hereafter and the other only wants the dunya. The one who aims for the akhirah, for the hereafter, their level will be way higher than those who seek the dunya. We learned that the hypocrites, they seek worldly benefits. That is their ultimate concern. And they will compromise on the hereafter 
in order to obtain worldly benefits. And we learn in the Quran that the hypocrites will be in the lowest level of hellfire. So can there be any comparison between someone who is in the lowest level of hell to someone who is in the higher levels of paradise? There is no comparison. And remember, even within paradise, there are many levels. According to a hadith, 100 levels in Jannah. And the difference between two levels of paradise is like the difference between the sky and the earth. Imagine, there's a huge difference. So aim for those heights, for the high levels of Jannah, and pray for Al-Firdaus, Jannah Al-Firdaus. And now we are given certain commands. So let us pay attention to the commands that we are given so that we can observe them in order to seek the home of the hereafter. لا تجعل مع الله إلها آخر. Do not make as equal with Allah another deity. Why? فتقعد مذموما مخذولا. And thereby become censured and forsaken. Meaning, if you call upon someone other than Allah, then you will in fact be abandoned. You won't be helped neither by Allah. Because shirk is the greatest injustice and nor by those that you call upon because they are unable to help you. So this is a lose-lose situation. And your Lord has decreed that you not worship except Him. And to parents, good treatment. And when they're old, then whether one or both of them reach old age while with you, say not to them so much as oof. And do not repel them, but speak to them a noble Word, a respectable word. So here we see that old age is mentioned specifically. Because in old age, remember, as people, they become weak and fragile. They deserve even more compassion and care. And especially if they're your parents. But because a person is typically busy at that time when their parents have become elderly, Why are they busy? Because they have their own work, they have their own children, and of course the times have changed. Then a person needs a lot of patience and tolerance with their elderly parents. Not just tolerance, but ihsan. Because wabil walidaini ihsana. You don't just put up with them, but you must be extra nice to them. So that means, فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفٍ Do not even say uf to them. Uf is an expression of frustration. And it's a very small word, which means that if uf is not allowed, then anything other than that is not allowed either. So do not express annoyance in response to their repeated requests, for example. And this also means that you should not scold them. You should not be harsh with them. You should not belittle them especially when you have differences with them. And of course, there are going to be differences between you and your elderly parents because your priorities are completely different. Your goals are different. Your lifestyle may now be very different from what they're used to. Your needs are different. Your concerns are different. So there will be clashes. But remember, at this age, you cannot expect your parents to change. That is unrealistic. You must be compassionate and respectful and gentle with your parents. Remember, being able to care for elderly parents is actually a privilege. And hurting them, not earning Jannah by serving them, this is a huge loss. The Prophet ﷺ said, disgrace, disgrace, disgrace. The people said, for who? And he said, he who sees either of his parents during their old age, or he sees both of them, but he does not enter Jannah. Why does he not enter Jannah? Because he failed them. He failed to serve them. He failed to treat them kindly. So remember, birrul walidain, being good to parents, is the best deed. According to one hadith, the best deed after salah. And if you want to see what kind of a person you are, then you look at two things. Your duty to Allah and your duty towards your parents. How is your salah? Is it on time? Is it proper? Is it that you are attentive? Or is it that you are negligent with regards to your prayer? That it gets delayed every other day? 
And secondly, look at your relationship with your parents. It's not necessary that you get along with them 100%, that you're buddy-buddy with them. No, it's about how you treat them, how you speak to them. Are you respectful? Do you show compassion and care? وَاخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ And lower to them the wing of humility out of mercy. Remember, خَفْضُ الْجَنَاحِ is to humble oneself, to come down, just as a bird descends, it lowers its wing when it is landing, when it is coming down. So be humble before your parents. Don't try to show that you are better than them. You must lower yourself. Don't be like that bird that is flying high. No, lower your wing. Come down. And even if they're speaking what is completely illogical to you, or perhaps it is backward, perhaps it is their language, perhaps it is their accent, perhaps it's the fact that they don't understand the world as you do, still there is no need to insult your parents or to speak rudely to them or to show that you know better than them or that you are better than them. Rather, be humble and do not argue with them. وَاخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ Because remember, your rudeness and your harshness is very, very painful for your parents. Because think about it, they raised you. They showed you love when you were illogical. Have you ever seen a child in their terrible twos? Yani some children, their terrible twos, they continue for many years. So they're extremely loud, very illogical. They're throwing tantrums all the time. But your parents showed you love. They cared about you. So remember who you were. And sometimes, yes, it is difficult to be patient and respectful. You wonder, what is happening to my parents? Yani they used to be so strong emotionally and they were so logical. They were so understanding. They were your source of support. They were so sensible. So it's very hard to see them becoming weak. So in that case, seek the help of Allah that He should give them what you are not able to give them. وَقُلْ رَبِّ رَحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِي صَغِيرًا So make dua for them. On the one hand, show humility and be respectful. And on the other hand, make dua for them. That my Lord have mercy upon them as they brought me up when I was small. Meaning they took care of me when I was little. And now they need care. And I can never care for them as they cared for me. So Ya Rabb, you compensate where I fall short. And I am falling short in my duty towards my parents. رَبِّ رَحَمْهُمَا Oh Allah have mercy on them. And this includes good health. This includes their safety. This includes their patience, their dignity. And ya Allah, you have mercy upon them. And remember that the mother deserves even more kind treatment than the father. رَبُّكُمْ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا فِي نُفُوسِكُمْ Your Lord is most knowing of what is within yourselves. Meaning He knows what you go through as children. Allah knows the state of your heart. That why are you taking care of your parents? Is it to impress the world? Or is it with resentment? That when is it that I am going to become free? They looked after you, wishing for you good health and life. And many people look after their elderly parents, wishing for and waiting for their death. Subhanallah. What a huge difference. رَبُّكُمْ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا فِي نُفُوسِكُمْ Allah knows what is within yourselves. He knows your intention. So this is a warning. And this is also a consolation. Because sometimes what happens is that a person tries their best to take care of their parents. They try so hard. But some parents... Yani, given their old age, given their illness or given their condition, they are never happy with what their children do. In fact, they can actually be very abusive or they begin to emotionally blackmail their own children. That if you don't do this, then I will pray against you. And if your father is not pleased with you, if your mother is not pleased with you, then you have done no good. I am your mother, I have your right. So sometimes it happens that no matter what a child does, the parents are just not happy. So then what do you do? رَبُّكُمْ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا فِي نُفُوسِكُمْ Allah knows what is it 
that is in your hearts. That you are trying to do your best. You do want the best. However, إِن تَكُونُوا صَالِحِينَ فَإِنَّهُ كَانَ لِلْأَوَّابِينَ غَفُورًا If you should be righteous in intention, then indeed he is ever to the often returning to him forgiving. Meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will pardon you. So yes, there are times when the most loving and caring children also slip. They end up hurting their parents. They end up falling short in their duty towards them. So then what to do at this time? Turn back to Allah. Ask Him for forgiveness. So Allah is to awabin, to those who turn back to Him repeatedly, He is ghafoor towards them, forgiving. This is why we should make dua to Allah. That Ya Allah, You forgive me, You pardon me with respect to my negligence when it comes to my parents. That I don't respect them the way they deserve that respect. There are times when I fall short in my duty to my parents. So Ya Allah, You forgive me. So the state of your heart, sometimes, yes, it changes. Sometimes even your feelings fluctuate. But your behavior is what you have to watch. Your attitude towards your parents should always be respectful. And where you do slip, then you seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And give the relative his right. And also the poor and the traveler. And do not spend wastefully. وَلَا تُبَذِّرْ tabdira. And you see, tabdir, this is to scatter seeds around. So don't scatter your money throwing it around. Why? Because indeed the wasteful are brothers of the devils. And ever has shaitan been to his Lord ungrateful. So don't scatter your money in bits and pieces here and there like seeds are scattered because then you'll run out. You see, tabdeer, being wasteful, this is to spend more than what is necessary. It is to spend on things that are unnecessary. It is basically to waste one's money. How? By spending it on every wish and every desire or on things which are wrong. Ibn Mas'ud explained, these are الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي غَيْرِ حَقْ They are those people who spend money in wrong places, where a person should not spend money. So tabdeer is something that we have to be careful about. And unfortunately, in this day and age where, you know, no matter what you have is never enough, no matter what you have is never new enough. So there is a lot of temptation, and we must be careful, because this is like a trap. Once you get caught up in it, then your money, it keeps going away from you. And at the end, you're left with hardly anything. And so you're not able to spend it on good causes then. You're not able to spend it on those who need. You're not able to spend it in a way that will benefit you in the hereafter. In a hadith, we learned that there will be people from my ummah who will eat foods of various colors and types and will drink beverages of various colors and types, meaning a lot of variety. And they're only concerned about fulfilling their desires. And they will wear clothing of various colors and types. They will be careless in speech and will ride on mounts of various colors and types. And these are the worst people of my ummah. Why? Because their ultimate concern is to look good, to eat good, to drink good. Yani their only concern is to spend on their desires. So remember, we will be asked not just about how we earned our money, but also how we spent it. And remember, wasting money is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislikes. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Allah dislikes three things for you. Qeel wa qal and idha'at mal Wasting money. Wa kathrat su'al. So wasting money, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like that. And if you must turn away from the needy, awaiting mercy from your Lord, which you expect, then speak to them a gentle word. Meaning sometimes people demand from you that you spend on them, that you give them, that you lend them. But you're not always in a position to do that. So even if you must refuse, refuse or excuse yourself gently. And do not make your hand as chained to your neck or extend it completely and thereby become blamed and insolvent. Meaning don't go to the other extreme and become stingy. Indeed, your Lord extends provision for whom he wills and restricts it. Indeed, he is ever concerning his servants, acquainted and seeing. He knows what you're doing. And do not kill your children for fear of poverty. Because we provide for them and for you. Indeed, their killing is ever a great sin. 
So we see the rights of children are mentioned over here. Their right to live. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more merciful to people than their parents are to them. People think that they should kill their children at times when their children are a financial burden on them. We learn in a hadith that when the Prophet ﷺ was asked about the greatest sins, he mentioned to kill your son lest he should share your food with you. Meaning a person becomes so stingy, so selfish, that he doesn't want to have a child who will share his food with him. إِنَّ قَتْلَهُمْ كَانَ خِطُؤًا kabira. Their killing is ever a great sin. So remember, once the fetus has life in it, then killing it, aborting it, that is also a murder. And do not approach unlawful sexual intercourse. Indeed, it is ever an immorality and is evil as a way. Don't even go near zina. And do not kill the soul which Allah has forbidden, except by right. And whoever is killed unjustly, we have given his heir authority. But let him not exceed limits in the matter of taking life. Indeed, he has been supported by the law. And do not approach the property of an orphan, except in the way that is best, until he reaches maturity. And fulfill every commitment. وَأَوْفُوا بِالْعَهْدِ Indeed, the commitment is ever that about which one will be questioned. So be very careful when you give your word to someone, when you commit to something. First of all, don't go on making promises over every little thing. And then when you do make a promise, then fulfill it. And if you're not able to fulfill it, then let the other person know in advance and apologize and find out how you can make up for it. وَأَوْفُوا الْكَيْلَ إِذَا كِلْتُمْ And give full measure when you measure. And weigh with an even balance. That is the best way and best in result. وَلَا تَقْفُ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ And do not pursue that of which you have no knowledge. Because in the السَّمْعَ وَالْبَصَرَ وَالْفُؤَادَ كُلُّ أُولَئِكَ كَانَ عَنْهُ مَسْؤُولًا Indeed the hearing, the sight and the heart about all those one will be questioned. So we see here that a person should not pursue that of which they have no knowledge. Meaning a person should not confuse assumption with fact. Meaning don't say something unless you are fully certain. And do not base your actions or life on assumption. Base it on fact. And remember, revelation is fact. So in this ayah, there is basically intellectual reform. You see, there are levels of awareness. One is that you assume something. The other is that you know something based on certain knowledge and facts. So when you speak, when you take action, when you do something, make sure it is based on factual knowledge and not mere assumption. And this includes not passing on every single thing that we have heard without confirmation. And we should not assume things about other people all the time either. Because we have been told to refrain from assumption. Because some assumption can actually be sinful. Qatada said, do not say I have seen when you did not in fact see. Or I heard when you did not actually hear. Or I know when you do not actually know. Because Allah will ask you about all of this. All of these faculties, we will be questioned about them. Did you use them or not? And how did you use them? So we should use them in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And do not walk upon the earth exultantly. Indeed, you will never tear the earth apart, and you will never reach the mountains in height. Remember, it is a sign of Allah's righteous servants that they walk with humility. يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا And remember, when there is humility inside, then there is contentment, and there is a healthy confidence, which is reflected in a person's manner of walking as well. Then a person does not walk lazily, nor do they overspeed. When there is calmness and composure inside, it is reflected in a person's manner of walking also. And remember, walking arrogantly is something that brings about Allah's wrath. We learn, اِخْتَالَ فِي مِشْيَةِ Whoever is arrogant in the manner of his walking, he will meet Allah while Allah will be غَضْبَان with him, very angry with him. All that, its evil, is ever in the sight of your Lord, detested. So leave such things. That is from what your Lord has revealed to you of wisdom. And do not make as equal with Allah another deity, lest you be thrown into hell, blamed and banished. Again, we are warned against shirk. 
Then has your Lord chosen you for having sons and taken from among the angels' daughters? Indeed, you say a grave saying. And we have certainly diversified the contents in this Quran that mankind may be reminded, but it does not increase the disbelievers except in aversion. Say, if there had been with him other gods, as they say, then they each would have sought to the owner of the throne a way. Meaning there would be a lot of competition then. Subhanahu, exalted is he, and high above what they say by great sublimity. تُسَبِّحُ لَهُ السَّمَاوَاتُ السَّبْعُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَمَنْ فِيهِنْ The seven heavens and the earth, and whatever is in them, exalt him. And there is not a thing except that it exalts Allah by his praise. But you do not understand their way of exalting. Indeed, he is ever forbearing and forgiving. Imagine everything, whether it is animate or inanimate, everything is glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We learn in a hadith that even an ant colony is an ummah min al-umami to sabbihu. It is a community from among different communities that glorifies and praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember, tasbih is the best speech that you can make. It's the best words that you can utter. It is words that are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that are chosen for His servants. Subhanallah, subhanallah wa bihamdi. Wa idha qara'ta al-Qur'an. And when you recite the Qur'an, we put between you and those who do not believe in the hereafter a concealed partition and we have placed over their hearts coverings lest they understand it and in their ears is deafness and when you mention your lord alone in the quran meaning one they turn back in aversion so there are people who do not like the message of the quran they do not like its contents and they do not understand the wisdom of the quran and they especially dislike it when la ilaha illallah is mentioned wallaw ala adbari nufura Aus ibn Abdullah said that saying La ilaha illallah chases shaitan away. And then he recited this ayah. We are most knowing of how they listen to it, when they listen to you, and of when they are in private conversation. When the wrongdoers say, you follow not, but a man affected by magic. So they stop from believing themselves and they also dissuade others from coming to you and believing. Look how they strike for you comparisons. The Prophet ﷺ was far from being affected by magic. But they have strayed so they cannot find a way. And they say, when we are bones and crumbled particles, will we truly be resurrected as a new creation? Say, be you stones or iron. Meaning even if centuries go by, and your bodies have decomposed, and they have turned into the matter, has turned into stones or iron, or any creation of that which is great within your chests. Remember, resurrection is real. Allah will still resurrect you, no matter what your body turns into. And they will say, who will restore us? Who is capable of doing that? Say, he who brought you forth the first time. Allah, then they will nod their heads toward you and say, when is that? Say, perhaps it will be soon. On the day, he will call you and you will respond with praise of him and think that you had not remained in the world except for a little. وَقُلْ لِعِبَادِي يَقُولُ الَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ And tell my servants to say that which is best. Indeed, shaitan induces dissension among them. Indeed, shaitan is ever to mankind a clear enemy. So we see here that if we truly want to be Allah's ibad, Allah's good, righteous servants, then we have to watch what comes out of our mouths. We are not machines. I mean, we are human. We get upset, we get hurt, we get annoyed. But we still have control over what we say. And if we speak carelessly, then remember, shaitan becomes successful in damaging our relationships. So good speech not only saves a person from potential problems, it is in fact something that brings about Allah's forgiveness as well. In a hadith we learn that good speech, yujibul jannah. It brings about the result of jannah, meaning it definitely a person will enter jannah because of that. رَبُّكُمْ أَعْلَمُ بِكُمْ Your Lord is most knowing of you. Because sometimes we go on, you know, explaining ourselves. I said this because of such and such reason. You know, we go on justifying ourselves. 
Allah is most knowing of you. If He wills, He will have mercy upon you. Or if He wills, He will punish you. And we have not sent you over them as a manager. And your Lord is most knowing of whoever is in the heavens and the earth. And we have made some of the prophets exceed others in various ways. And to Dawood we gave the book. Meaning, Zabur. Say, invoke those you have claimed as gods besides him. For they do not possess the ability of removal of adversity from you. They are not capable of removing any hardship from you. Or for its transfer to someone else. They can't do that. Those whom they invoke... Who are they in reality? They actually call upon Allah themselves. Yani they are in need of Allah. So it is said, they seek means of access to their Lord, striving as to which of them would be nearest. And they hope for His mercy and fear His punishment. Indeed, the punishment of your Lord is ever feared. Meaning it is definitely something worth fearing. We see that among the Arabs, there were people who would worship the jinn. And we learned that eventually, any those jinn who were worshipped by these people, those jinn became Muslim. And so they were very afraid that there are people who worship us. And these jinn would themselves seek the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His mercy. So the people who continue to worship them are being reprimanded. That you are calling upon a creation who itself is in need of Allah who itself is trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is afraid of the punishment of Allah. So what are you doing? وَإِن مِّن قَرْيَةٍ And there is no city, but that we will destroy it before the day of resurrection or punish it with a severe punishment that has ever been in the register inscribed. And nothing has prevented us from sending signs except that the former peoples denied them. And we gave Thamud, the she-camel, as a visible sign, but they wronged her. And we send not the signs except as a warning. And remember, when we told you, indeed your Lord has encompassed the people, so there's no need to fear them. And we did not make the sight, meaning the journey of Isra, which we showed you except as a trial for the people, as was the accursed tree that is mentioned in the Qur'an, meaning the Zakum. Because when the mushrikeen, when they found out, when they heard about these matters, they made fun of the Prophet wasallam. That how could you have gone in one night? And there are people who will make fun of Isra and Mi'raj even today. And they will find things in the Qur'an which they find strange and they start making fun of it. So yes, this is a fitna. This is a trial for them. And we threaten them, but it increases them not except in great transgression. You see, this information which is given in the Qur'an, whatever it is, this is to encourage us to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us of certain things, any, this is to threaten us, to stop us from our wrongdoing. But then there are people who don't benefit from that warning at all. And mention when we said to the angels, prostrate to Adam. And they prostrated except for Iblis. He said, should I prostrate to one you created from clay? Look at his arrogance. Iblis said, do you see this one whom you have honored above me? Look at his arrogance. He said, any Adam made of clay, you've honored him above me? Is he even worthy of that? You see, Iblis criticized Allah's decision. Why? Because he thought he understood better. He knew better. And a lot of people make this mistake. They think they know better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they pass judgment. They criticize the Quran. They criticize what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees. He said, if you delay me until the day of resurrection, I will surely destroy his descendants except for a few. You see, Iblis is not just our enemy. He is also the enemy of our children because he said, I will destroy his descendants, his children, except for a few. And look at this word, this is when locusts eat whatever is on a certain piece of land. Meaning that they have full mastery over it with their mouths. Because al-hanak is the mouth. So when an animal pulls out a plant from its root with its mouth, and completely uprooting it, completely destroying it, this is ihtinak. So I will completely annihilate. I will destroy his children, his descendants. And ihtinak is also to have full control over an animal. 
So for example, a horse, you know, when the rope is passed through the mouth and the horse is in full control, this is also ihtinak. So I will gain mastery over his children. So I will lead them and I will command them and they will obey me. You see, Iblis begins working on human beings and harming them from the moment a human being enters this world. Yani as soon as the child is born, what does shaitan do? Shaitan smacks the child. So the child cries. Ibn Abbas said, when someone is born, shaitan takes hold of him. And if Allah is mentioned, shaitan goes away. If Allah is not mentioned, he remains firm in his heart. This is why as soon as a child is born, Yani we should make it a point to make some dhikr over there. Recite Ayatul Kursi. Recite the Mu'awwidat. And recite Quran over there to protect your child. Sometimes people will wait for, you know, the following day or for like a couple of hours so that someone will come and make the adhan so that the shaitan will go away. It, this has to happen as soon as a child is born. Don't wait. قَالَ ذهب. Allah said, go. For whoever of them follows you, indeed hell will be the recompense of you, an ample recompense. وَاسْتَفْزِزْ مَنِ اسْتَطَعْتَ مِنْهُمْ بِصَوْتِكَ And incite to senselessness, whoever you can among them with your voice, and assault them with your horses and foot soldiers, and become a partner in their wealth and their children, and promise them. But shaitan does not promise them, except delusion. So these are the ways of shaitan. How he attacks and misleads mankind. Inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan. Indeed, over my believing servants, there is for you no authority. Meaning shaitan cannot harm them. Because shaitan cannot have control over them. And sufficient is your Lord as disposer of affairs. So your biggest strength against shaitan is your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are only safe with Him when you become of ibadi, Allah's righteous servants. So don't do anything that will deprive you of Allah's love and Allah's protection. And when a mistake happens, then again turn back to Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I hope we were all listening in these past few hours. Really beautiful. Um, we've only gone through, I think, a bit half of Surah Isra. And then next week will be our last class. And then we'll have a like one class holiday, inshallah. Um, and then we will use Zoom uh, just 16 after. Like I said, this week we're halfway through just 15. Next week we'll finish just 15. Um, then the quiz will be open. All of that stuff. Um so then, um, what have we learned in these past few ayahs? So a lot of people make the mistake of criticizing the truth of Allah and, and they think that they know better than Him. Yeah, so this is kind of, sometimes we make the mistake as well. As Muslims, um, we think that what we're going to do or our plans are better than Allah's plans, okay? What we know is better than what Allah knows. But we, so sometimes it comes indirectly, okay, in our actions, okay. He said that he will destroy everyone except for a few and again command over them. So, um, the shaitan, he said, when I go to mislead your believers, I'll mislead majority of them, but a few will be left. Okay, now these few are the believers, okay. These few are the ones who, who sought um, refuge from Allah from the tricks of shaitan. Okay, so these people are the ones who have um, control over themselves. As soon as a child is born, Shaitan immediately starts to attack the child. Do not wait to make that for the child. Yes, yeah, so as soon as the child is born, uh, make that then do the in in uh, in that room, maybe loud. Our greatest strength against Shaitan is Allah. Yes, yeah, so the only way through which we can gain strength and shield from Shaitan is by making dua. Okay, is by controlling our desires. Respecting parents, yes, there was a um a big chunk of respecting respect of parents um at the start of Surah Isra. Um, what did we learn about respecting parents? Never spend your money wastefully because if you do, then you are from the friends of Shaitan. Yeah. So when you just when you have a lot of money, or maybe when you have um money that you don't really need, 
and it's kind of like in your savings or you just use it um, if you want to go out or maybe you're on holiday, um, don't waste it for no reason, okay? Obviously, if you need the money or sometimes it's okay to, you know, um, treat yourself or anything like that, but don't go to extreme lengths to waste money, okay? Don't buy things that are a waste of money, okay? Just because you have the advantage of that money does not mean that you have to use it in the wrong way. Seek the help of a lot to protect our parents. Yes. And don't say something until we know about it completely. Yes. Yeah, so that's usually how rumors spread, right? When we hear something or we think we heard something or we partially hear something um, or incomplete piece of information. And then we tell someone else and that person tells someone else. Okay. And there's actually an, an, uh, an, a word in Arabic for someone who passes on information from one person to another, which is either of sin or false information. And this person is called a qattar. Okay. Um, we have to make sure it is true and factual knowledge. Yeah, so here's the thing elaborated on respecting parents. We have to treat our parents with respect, especially when they get older. Because when um, uh, humans get older, we also get weaker. Okay, so there's a, a point where we reach in life where we're at full strength, and then after that, we start to deteriorate. You have to be extra nice to them. We cannot even say oof to them. At this age, we can't expect them to change. Instead, we must be compassionate towards them. Yes. So it's hard for you to change when you grow older. Rather, it's better if you um, change yourself for them. Okay. Yeah, we should be grateful like the Prophet Nuh and the Prophet Ibrahim Okay. Grateful even on the little things in life. Okay. Maybe having food to eat. Or a roof over your head, or maybe something you got new, or maybe something you found in your room that you really like. Okay, be grateful on those little things. If we speak badly, shaitan succeeds in our in breaking our relationships. Yeah, so when you speak excessively, um, and when you speak ex excessively badly, just comes along the way. Okay, or when you speak badly, also shaitan succeeds in breaking our relationships and creating problems. Okay, yeah, lost created creatures we don't even know of. Yes. Something again, we're going to learn in Surah Nur. It's a really beautiful ayah. Okay, inshallah, we will finish the class now. Um, there's a lot, a lot of beautiful points, but we don't have time to go over all of them. Um, inshallah, next week we will finish just 15, and then um, there'll be the quiz, Kahoot, and then the week after we'll, we will have a holiday. All right. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiru wa tubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.